The number of suicides in the Canadian military rose last year as thousands of soldiers returned, uh, returned home from the battlefields of Afghanistan. The Department of Natural Defense says 19 men and one woman died by suicide in the Canadian forces in 2011, up from 12 in 2010. The department cautions against reading too much into these statistics, saying there is no proof they signal an upward trend. To talk more about this is Dr. Mark Leach, psychiatrist and clinical teacher, University of Toronto, and he's with us now. Good afternoon, doctor. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to uh, to uh, talk to us about this. No is, problem. Is this an upward trend, or are we just hearing more about it? Uh, I think this is an upward trend. Uh, there's three things that uh, contribute to uh, suicide in post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, and particularly military. One has to do with social isolation, and men, particularly uh, with this sort of trauma, are not prone to talk. The other has to do with substance abuse, which has always been associated with the military, particularly alcohol, and survivor guilt. But the thing that's really driving it up is there's tremendous, there's always been ambivalence about our Canadian involvement in Afghanistan, and that is increasing with discussion of withdrawal, leaving the question, which was always there, what are we here for? Um, uh, which has always been a question about being in Afghanistan and is now increasing, uh, you know, for the soldiers involved because there's questions of, of leaving. So I think that's what's driving the rate up. Most would think that the, the latter problem that you spoke of uh, wouldn't be an issue because soldiers are soldiers and, and we hear so much from their superiors that they're professional and they don't care about the political stripe of the day or even the battle for that matter. But you're suggesting that if, you know, uh, uh, troops spend a long period of time in any one place and come out without any real gain, they, they may not feel very good about it. Well, it reflects uh, both an individual conflict, and conflict is, uh, 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 unconscious conflict is, is what uh, uh, drives the psychiatric morbidity. So there's an unconscious conflict in the patients, uh, in the, if you will, or the, uh, the soldiers, but there is also a conflict within our nation about war in general, and this one in particular. And so I think the suicides are also symptomatic, not just of individuals, but of the society, and also the society that these soldiers return to. Uh, mm, oh, I see. Cause it, so it's more about wh- uh, when they're returning. Because I'm thinking, would that the type of person that would be sensitive to those types of issues be a soldier anyway? Well, you have two people, that, types of people that, that sign up for the military, and there's a bit of a mixture. But there are uh, men out of the male hunting brain that are thrilled to kill. It does turn on the brain uh, in terms of the, uh, the receptors. But the other large part of our soldiers come often from rural communities who do this really as a career move that the family has done right. and uh, often are lied to, the Americans are, uh, that they'll be you know, stationed at a mall nearby. But then when they find themselves in the horrible reality of war, uh, this creates all kinds of confusion in them. And it's that group that are more at risk of suicide. Now, is there a discrepancy in uh, how many or what the numbers actually are? Because it seems that... Uh, that some Somebody in the military might suggest that it's an issue, whereas somebody in the government might suggest that it's not. Well, yeah, because everybody is going to see it through their own bias and, frankly, spin. And uh, so depending on your viewpoint, but as a physician and as a, uh, my view is that uh, there are definitely predictors about why this rate is going to go up. Um, and again, we're not just talking about suicide. We're talking about a whole range of morbid, psychiatric morbidity here. I mean, suicide is the most obvious manifestation, but the decimation of war, which I see very much in my psychotherapy practice, is huge and ripples for generations. Uh, so there's also the related psychiatric morbidity of these men, uh, uh, generally men, coming back. How do you treat this? And, I'm, and, I, and I, from what I understand, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons a lot of them keep returning and, ha- and they just find it harder to adapt to that, that's a, a right. regular society. Exactly. Just like criminals, uh, in a paradoxical way, will want to return to the safety of, of, of imprisonment. Well, there's two issues in medicine. One is treatment and the other is prevention. The correct treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder is the judicious use of medication, but primarily what's called psychodynamic psychotherapy because all trauma occurs in an individual social context and it also occurs in a historical context in terms of the patient's life. And it's going to occur at a lot of, uh, we now know for sure, levels below conscious awareness, and that's just a neurological fact. And so you, you, you need a trusting relationship. Generally, this needs to be done one-on-one. There's some utility for group, but psychodynamic is best done one-on-one because there's so much trust that has to be developed around 
this individual, how they got into the military, what their feelings are about it, what their the horror of the experience that they uh, they had, and that you have to create a lot of safety uh, for that to get at places that are very uncomfortable and and consciously forbidden. The other thing has to do with prevention. I mean, there's no doubt that uh, in the face of nuclear war and cultural evolution, that war simply is out is outmoded in the sense that it comes out of the male hunting brain. And I belong to a group called Canadian, well, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and we were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 because there was an article published in the New England Journal to show there is no medical response to a nuclear bomb. The other issue around militarism is we simply can't afford it in the face of the, these very serious environmental crises we have. There is a private member's bill before the House of Commons, which has been there for a number of years, which is having public hearings, but not much notice. And that essentially is to get rid of the euphemistic Department of Defense, because there are no departments of offense, and create a Department of Peace and Conflict Resolution. And Principal negotiation is an essential skill in modern society, whether it has to do with bullies in the schoolyard, whether it has to do with uh, working in business and certainly marriage, and definitely foreign policy. And I think um, if, the, if your listeners are interested, the, the name of the website is the Campaign uh, for a Canadian Department of, of Peace. Um, and that, that's great for us, Doctor, but what about the rest of the wackos in the world? Well, that's also an illusion. Um, we're all human, actually, and we're primates, actually, which was Freud's great discovery. And we're driven, on the other hand, by our cortex, which has trouble catching up. And so we tend to project on, well, you see this with driving. You know, everybody else doesn't know how to drive, you know, but mm-hmm, you. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, that's not always the case, and, and generally males are more aggressive uh, coming out of evolutionary reasons. It is an illusion, and all religion aspires to the concept of empathy, which basically is looking this and seeing the humanity in all of us because we are actually primates. And so the, what's called externalization or villainization is a very, very uh, and, uh, dangerous uh, position for us at this stage in civilization. And that's why the skills that are required of principled negotiation um, you know, are very important. Of course, then we think our spouses are horrible, you know, when, whoever we get into a conflict with. And the less we know them, the more easy it is to villainize them. And there's nothing like another automobile that cuts you off to confirm what you think you've always known. <laughs> uh, getting back to the soldiers and, uh, and their post-traumatic stress, is there any way to, uh, to treat or train these people uh, uh, better in this before we actually send them into the battlefield? Is there no. any way to prepare them ahead of time? No, because you're putting people into really an unsustainable, life-threatening horror. Uh, and 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 they're really you can't prepare people for that. It's 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 an illusion that you can, and therefore, like with a, a nuclear bomb, the only way to fundamentally uh, uh, prevent post traumatic stress disorder is to evolve beyond the solution of violent conflict. Wow, but again, you know, uh, obviously, you know how big of a task that is. I mean, you know, it's not a case of just us; it's well, the that's rest right. of the world. Well, the, the movement to create international peace, uh, departments of peace and conflict resolution is an international movement. There are a number of countries that already have them, uh, uh, Costa Rica, for instance. And, of course, at the United Nations level, there are, you know, and basically we're talking about a fundamental paradigm shift in how we see being human beings. You're right, it's that big. On the other hand, literally everything is at stake for us as a species because because of the environmental crisis in so many ways and nuclear weapons, we simply cannot survive, we cannot evolve with continuing uh, with, with violent armed co- conflict resolution. So you don't see uh, any sort of positive sign in the military as far as reducing these until you well, reduce the would, way we I, look what at I would the world? With the military, we won the Nobel Peace Prize for peacekeeping. And there's no doubt that we do need policing at all levels of society, including internationally. But, but policing, of course, is, is, is uh, under due process of law, and vested interests have to be, you know, uh, not, you know, not causing the bias, the difference between vigilantism and, and policing. And, and uh, the military skills that we have as a nation and peacekeeping, which we have innovated, is essential for future human survival. That is the role, I think, and I, I think definitely the training of, well, let's call it military at the moment, but essentially peacekeeping is essential. And that's a role where our current military could play and has played a, a leadership role for uh, a number of, de- uh, you know, since the Suez Canal crisis in the 1950s. Is there a website we can go to, Doctor, to find out more about what you're talking about? There's two. Uh, there's, so there's the uh, uh, Campaign for a Canadian Department of Peace, 
And then there is the group I belong to, uh, is, which is won the Nobel Peace Prize in Canada, is called uh, Canadian Physicians for Global Survival. They both have websites. All right, Dr. Mark Keith, uh, sorry, Leach has been with us. Leith has been with us. Dr. Mark Leith, psychiatrist and clinical teacher at the University of Toronto. Thank you very much for your time, doctor. Much appreciated. My pleasure. It is uh, 1228. It's 900 CHML. I'm Scott Thompson. I don't think it's that easy. And it was interesting how uh, the doctor, uh, you know, the discussion started off as um, uh, how we can help our military and the people returning home and what we can do for post-traumatic stress and the number of suicides in the Canadian military that uh, appears to be rising. Uh, the doctor's take on that is just don't go to war, which I think would be a beauty idea. <laughs> But unfortunately, not everybody buys into that. And um, well, and a lot of people feel that that's not a choice for them. Well, you know, I, you know, it's it's really easy to you know to go in and, and, and say that we're uh, that we're just going to be peacekeeping. But again, a lot of these decisions are made for us. Um, you know, uh, what do you do when a country is cleansing itself the way? Uh, we've seen in history, the way we're seeing with the Arab Spring right now, uh, the way we've seen in the past. God, look at Nazi, Nazi Germany. You know, what if we had all just sat around and done nothing and just defended our own, you know, how do you keep the peace when there's an aggressive person? Sooner or later, you have to be aggressive, don't you? Don't you have to be aggressive to take down aggressive people? Or can you just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya and pretend they'll go away? I don't think it works that way. I think it's a lot more complicated. Although, Let's move towards it. Let's work towards it. Let's try to get everybody thinking the same way we do. But unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. Not in my lifetime.